Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Matt Wilson, a member of the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences and the Picard Institute for Learning and Memory. And uh, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce today's uh, BCS special seminar webinar speaker, Murganka Sur. Uh, uh, you may have read in his bio, but uh, Murganka has a long history uh, in his contributions to brain sciences, including his own personal research. Uh, that focused on the basic mechanisms and functions of cortical plasticity using a variety of techniques from electrophysiology to imaging and behavior. And that contribution extended to uh, his service as a uh, long uh, standing head of the department. Uh, Murganka really oversaw the expansion of the department in the the topic that he's going to cover, and that is understanding the bridge between molecules and mind. And that mission further extended as the director of the Simon Center for the Social Brain, which took on the challenge of understanding the basic mechanisms of neurodevelopmental disorders uh, with a focus on autism and autism spectrum disorders. And so together, Murganka has really tackled the big questions. How does the brain function? What are the basic mechanisms? How does it contribute to, uh, our, to behavior and understanding? And how does it go awry in dysfunctions, disease, and disorders? So it's a real pleasure to have had Murganka as a colleague of mine for the past quarter of a century. And I look forward to his talk today on his topic. Murganka. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, so uh, a very good afternoon from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And thank you for joining uh, during this uh, extraordinary COVID-19 era that we are in. Um, I'll talk today about a fundamental property of the brain and of the cerebral cortex of the brain in particular, namely cortical plasticity. Uh, I believe it is a ubiquitous yet deep property that underlies all of the extraordinary functions and computations that the cerebral cortex performs that underlies our cognition. Uh, all right. So the human brain has about 80 billion neurons and an equal, at least equal number of non-neuronal cells that are organized into modular processing systems. The cerebral cortex of the brain is 80% of the brain in humans, and its neurons are organized into networks. They are not randomly sprinkled in the brain. They form long distance pathways. They form local networks. There is a huge variety of them, maybe few hundred types of neurons, which, which interconnect in precise ways to form circuits that carry out computations that underlie cognition. And cognition, as the Oxford Dictionary defines it, is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. Human cognition is extraordinary and I'm going to argue with you today that one reason why we have the extraordinary capacities that we do is because of the nexus of circuits and their dynamic uh, 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 updating by plasticity. Plasticity, of course, also underlies the way that these circuits are created in the first place. So the big picture of my talk is that plasticity is crucial in two ways. Plasticity is crucial for computations underlying cognition. This is evident in the ease with which we incorporate context into cognition. Uh, for instance, if I were to ask Matt, shall we go for a walk? And Matt says, it's raining. With just a few words, we have conveyed a huge amount of knowledge and information that we go for a walk outside, that when it rains, that happens outside. Often that's not pleasant and therefore walking outside in the rain is not likely to be something we would want to do. 
we understand all this seamlessly and the seamless integrated integration of experience right from the time we are born into cognition is a very hard thing for artificial systems or AI systems. And yet I believe may be key for next generation AI. The second point is that understanding plasticity is fundamental for understanding, for, for a conceptual understanding of a wide range of brain disorders, particularly developmental disorders of the brain. I'll be telling you towards the end of my talk how there are hundreds of genes that have been implicated in brain disorders and how might we link them into a framework for what do these genes, which make hundreds of different molecules, what do they do? And plasticity provides a window. All right. So the cortex arises out of a sequence of developmental steps that begin very early in utero and is enabled by gradients of molecules that are gradients of transcription factors that set up combinatorial combinations by which cortical areas get defined. These molecules in turn form the, form the basis for axonal pathways to form from lower to higher cortical centers, from, from, from lower to higher regions of the brain, including in the cortex. These pathways bring information from the outside and are central to the formation of synapses and circuits. And then the outside world, as well as activity, impinges on neurons and their synapses in order to remodel circuits that match brain processing to the world that we grow up in. And these mechanisms continue into adulthood as mechanisms for learning and memory. So cortical areas and pathways form early, synapses and circuits consolidate later in these later stages of development and are shaped by mechanisms of plasticity which also enable learning and memory. The outline of my talk is that I'll talk today about first how plasticity wires cortical circuits during development and continuously, dynamically updates these circuits in order to enable computations. And the idea of plasticity as intrinsically linked with computation leads us to think about how the algorithms or the learning rules by which plasticity may be implemented. And I'll introduce two ideas, the idea of Hebbian plasticity, but importantly, the idea of synaptic renormalization as two complementary rules by which neurons and synapses get wired. We will take a deeper dive and talk in a very reduced way with very recent experiments in which I'll describe how we can assay learning rules in individual cortical neurons with very precise experiments that lead us to propose that these ideas of heavy and plasticity and synaptic renormalization come together into the phenomena of locally coordinated synaptic plasticity. And this is how plasticity is instantiated in neurons. And then we will, in the last part of my talk, talk about how plasticity impacts brain circuits, uh, uh, functional brain circuits, not just individual neurons, with an example for, from plasticity in the visual cortex of the brain and extending into developmental disorders and how they impact plasticity as a core conceptual uh, a source of dysfunction. All right, so first on the role of plasticity in wiring cortical circuits and later in modulating computations. So one of the ways by which one can examine the role of plasticity is to induce, is to induce a massive amount of it. And many years ago when I started my lab at MIT, my, 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 my co-workers and I did the following experiment. We asked very early in development, while the normal visual pathways are developing and the normal auditory pathways are developing, vision begins with the eyes and the eyes project to the visual thalamus here called the LGN, which projects to the visual cortex. The ears project to midbrain structures called the inferior colliculi, which project to the thalamic structure called the MGN, which projects to the auditory cortex. And 
we asked a very simple question, which, which, which ended up being quite profound. What is intrinsically visual about visual structures in the brain? What would happen if we make the axons from the eye or the wires from the eye go to auditory structures so that the auditory thalamus and cortex would be driven by visual activity. I remind you that all of information from the world is present in the brain through the electrical activity in neurons and the, and the spike patterns in neurons. So we did the following experiment. We took newborn ferrets and we removed the inputs to the auditory thalamus. And we found that that made visual projections go to the auditory thalamus. And we repeated these experiments in mice, but the experiments in ferrets were the most profound. And I want to show you a painting that uh, 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 my wife and I actually made a special trip to the Chartreuse Museum in Krakow to see. It's called Portrait of a Lady with Ferret by Leonardo. It's a beautiful painting. And it illustrates at a glance why a ferret is actually a remarkable animal as a model system for human development. First, it has frontally placed eyes. So in, in terms of visual processing, it can mimic many features of the human visual system. But second, and even more importantly, a ferret is born at a very early stage in development, almost the equivalent of the first and end of the first half of gestation in humans. So we can take newborn ferrets and we can remove these input pathways from the auditory midbrain to the thalamus. And we find that that creates this novel pathway from the eye to auditory thalamus to the auditory cortex. And the question is, what does it do? And it does something remarkable. We let these animals grow up and then we find that in the auditory cortex, all the wired animals, we see visually responsive cells and visual circuits that are normally present in the visual cortex of normal animals. So in the visual cortex, it has been known for 70 years, that or 60 years, that there are orientation selective cells. We see the world the way we do is because there are neurons in our brain and there are neurons in the brain of, of, of a ferret that respond to oriented bars and edges of light. And not only do these neurons exist, but they exist in a particular pattern whereby groups of neurons that like one orientation or another or another form a cluster called a pinwheel by which they map onto the visual cortex. Normal ferrets have this and rewired animals that have grown up with visual inputs into the auditory pathway have orientation selective cells that also get clustered in pinwheels. And why? Because the nature of the underlying circuit has changed in the normal visual cortex. If you ask what are the local connections between neurons, we find that cells with similar orientation connect to each other. And that's what is shown in these patches. That's all the blue patches connect to each other, all the red patches and so forth. In the normal auditory cortex, cells that respond to the same sound frequency connect to each other. In the rewired auditory cortex, there is no sound input into the cortex because those input pathways have been removed in order to induce the rewiring. But the local connections connect neurons of the same orientation preference. So it is the same cortex. The rewired cortex and the normal auditory cortex are the same cortex. They have no knowledge of the outside world other than the pattern of electrical activity in the projection from the auditory thalamus to the cortex. And in the normal case, these projections are driven by audition. In the rewired case, these projections are driven by vision. And that difference in the pattern of activity changes the circuitry in the cortex and makes it much more like a visual cortex than like a normal auditory cortex. And uh, I remind you that all that, 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 that these animals use the rewired auditory pathway, the visually responsive auditory pathway to now see albeit much more humbly than in normal animals. 
this kind of plasticity during development shapes cortical circuits by unsupervised learning. There is no teacher. There is just a pattern of activity in the pathway from the thalamus to the cortex by which the cortex wires itself. But in adults, in, in the adult brain, plasticity alters circuit function by two other forms of learning, called supervised and reinforcement learning. These forms of learning exist throughout the lifespan and they are used to make many, 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 many associations that we make in our life. For example, we learn the car, we need to press on the accelerator to stop it, we need to press on the brake, we shouldn't press them both at the same time. It's a completely arbitrary way by which cars are designed, yet we learn that yet millions of people have learned it. Almost everybody in this world who lives in an urban setting knows that red means stop and green means go. And these have been learned by observation, by a teacher, and to the extent that a learned, that a, that a learned behavior encodes reward, provides motivation, and uh, 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 we can use it to make decisions, and that's the idea of reinforcement learning. So we learn these arbitrary associations, and animals learn them too, and we can use such learning to ask, how does plasticity, which embodies this learning, change the brain? And so here's a mouse, and uh, several years ago, two very talented researchers in my lab, Michael Gord and Gerald Fo, did the following experiment. They started a whole new line of work in my lab in which they asked the following question. How does learning alter pathways and circuits that enable that learning and transform the animal's behavior? So, we, so they trained animals on, two, on, a, on an arbitrary visual task. This mouse has never seen visual gratings before till it came into our lab. And so we train the mouse that when it sees horizontal gratings moving up, it, it should lick a lick spout in order to be, receive a reward. When it sees vertical gratings moving to the right, it should not lick. If it does, it's a false alarm. So these are the hits, the current rejects, and then there are false alarm and misses when it, sh when it should lick and it doesn't. These probabilities of hits and false alarm can be described as response rates, and the difference between them in units of standard deviation provides the deep time, which is a measure of how clearly the animal separates the stimuli that define hits and rejects. And I'll show you a, a small video. Here's the mouse, here's the lick spout, here's the screen, and you'll see the, 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 the a stimulus moving either up the target or to the right as a non-target. There is a stimulus presentation of two seconds. There's a delay in this video. I'll just show you the longest delay, six seconds, which is the lifetime for a mouse. And then the, the lick spout will come forward and the animal should lick when it's supposed to. And I'll demonstrate that it does and it shouldn't when it should. And during this and later as well, in the, the, the goal of our experiment is to not only demonstrate that the mouse can learn, but what has changed. And we do that by two photon imaging of the activity of neurons in the visual cortex, in the parietal cortex, and in the motor cortex, because our logic is that the visual stimulus comes into the visual cortex, is transformed into the elements of a decision in the parietal cortex, and then that decision is executed in the motor cortex. And we want to image all three regions, and we did image them nearly simultaneously, these two simultaneously, and that separately in the same mice. So here's the experiment. So here's the behavior. So here's the, the stimulus, and then there's a delay, and then the lick spout comes forward and the mouse licks, if you can see the hand on my screen. And then here's a non-target stimulus, and here's the delay, and the lick spout will come forward, and the mouse does not lick. So it's a correct reject. And then here's another stimulus that is a non-target stimulus and the lick spout comes forward and the mouse does not lick. And then another target stimulus where the mouse is supposed to lick and it does, as you see here. All right. So then what do the responses look like? And the responses show signatures of learning the further up you go from the visual cortex. In the visual cortex, shown here, 
there are we can record hundreds of neurons with these with these optical tools and the neurons are sensitive to either horizontal bars or vertical bars shown here in context of the animal's response but as you go to the parietal cortex and particularly to the motor cortex to the frontal motor cortex animals the neurons are overwhelmingly tuned to getting a reward and so most of them respond to the horizontal bars and they respond rapidly and what you see here shown in red here is that even during the stimulus period of course the blue bars the blue line shows that the visual cortex neurons are responding but the amazing thing is that in the motor cortex itself with a few hundreds of milliseconds these neurons begin to respond and then that response stays high during the delay period and then the animal gets to lick and it dies so learning induced plasticity is reflected in the early activity of motor cortex neurons and this is a direct result of uh, 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 how the animal's behavior has been shaped and is reflected in neurons and the neurons in turn drive the behavior. We can do more complex analyses of these and I'll show you very quickly the analysis of populations of neurons that have been, have been imaged. For instance, if we have three neurons, we can plot their firing rate and that gives you a, 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 a trajectory by which we can compute what are these three neurons encoding. But if you have hundreds of neurons, that's 100 dimensions. So we do dimension reduction, and we can define a few principal components that, 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 that represent most of the information in these hundreds of neurons. And we do that, and we can ask, what is the trajectory of response of the population of neurons in the visual cortex? And we find that the trajectory says that these neurons continue to reflect just the stimulus. There are two kinds of responses neurons that respond to the horizontal stimulus, neurons that respond to the vertical stimulus. That is their orientation preference, and they continue to represent that as the first order derivation of what the stimulus is telling the animal. But then when we go to the there is a fundamental and significant transformation in the dynamic trajectory of these neurons. And you see that at a glance here. When the stimulus comes on, the neurons go and then they sit in this attractor basin till the animal is asked to respond and then another huge component of response comes on. So this has been well described in other situations as well and it's remarkable to see this plasticity induced population encoding of the behavior and of its representation in the brain. Here's one more example. You can train the animal to go or no go, and then we can ask it to switch. And task switching engages rapid behavioral plasticity. It's as if we learn that red means stop, green means go, and now we have to flip. And now we have to learn that red means go and green means stop. For many of us who have had long experience with one kind of, of task, it's actually very difficult to switch. In many developmental brain disorders, particularly autism spectrum disorders, such task switching is actually a crucial descriptive phenotype of the disorder. Do these animals switch? You bet. And you can show that mice that have learned one, one task rule, red means go, can now switch and now learn that blue or the vertical bars mean go. And the deep prime similarly goes in the other direction. What happens in the brain? In the brain, visual cortex neurons show no change in their orientation preference as expected. So here's a visual cortex neuron that likes horizontal oriented stimuli. And it did so in the original task and it continues to do so after the animal has learned the switch. And similarly here is a neuron that likes vertical orientations and vertical bars, and it continues to respond to the vertical bars. It has no representation of the meaning of these stimuli. But in the parietal cortex, something remarkable happens. And we know that these are the same neurons that, are, that we're recording because our optical methods allow us to follow the same neurons over days and weeks through and beyond a learning. 
So here is the parietal cortex neuron that would represent the horizontal orientation and its meaning that now you should lick when given the, when, when you're afforded to. And this neuron, after the animal has done the task, the task switching, now begins to respond to the vertical bars, which represent the reward or the reward inducing action. And so here's another neuron that does so. And therefore, it is in the projection from the visual cortex to the parietal cortex that this task switching and the plasticity that it engages lives. And we, and we see that in the population data as well. Visual cortex neurons show no change in their selectivity between the original task and the reverse task, whereas the posterior parietal cortex neurons used to respond to the horizontal bars and now they respond overwhelmingly to the vertical bar, meaning that they have switched their preference. And why do they do so? And our hypothesis is that task switching involves a signal. It involves signals of attention and it involves a signal that you should change your drive. And we have studied these signals. They involve acetylcholine as a signal of attention they involve norepinephrine as a signal of switching. And this is work in progress in our lab, but we have recent papers that describe at least the, the role of acetylcholine and the distribution of norepinephrine and other stuff is work in progress. So how might a posterior parietal cortex neuron switch? It might switch in the following way. It gets two sorts of inputs, one from horizontal orientation preference visual cortex neurons, and another set of inputs from neurons that prefer verticals. And in the original task, it is these synapses that drive this neuron. But now in the reversal task, it is the other synapses that drive the neuron. The animal has to learn to dissociate the drive from this set of synapses and associate the drive from the other set of synapses, and maybe the two are related. Hence, they might be locally coordinated. In fact, we strongly believe that they are because once an animal has learned the original task, it learns the reversal task in a surprisingly short period of time. And this presents another beautiful example of how reinforcement learning in the brain is really different from the way reinforcement learning occurs in artificial neural networks where a task switch in many instances is a huge deal. You have to learn the entire parameters of the task all over again. And finally, to reinforce the idea that plasticity and computation are embodied in the same neurons in the posterior parietal cortex, we can build decoders. Not only do, do neurons encode information, they encode the stimulus, they encode the reward, they encode the meaning of that stimulus by driving actions, but higher areas have to interpret the activity in lower areas by decoding the population activity. And brain areas do it, such as motor cortex that gets input from parietal, and we can do it too by building decoders, which is just a statistical technique for looking at what is it that a population of neurons is really telling us and what is it not telling us. And so we can build decoders for each time step and ask how well does it do, we can take half of our responses and trials and build the decoder and use the other half to test. And when you build decoders on a moment by moment basis, the posterior parietal cortex does very well. But when you build a decoder at one point in time and ask how long can this same population of neurons continue to represent the animals, either stimulus or choice, the neurons don't do so well. So when you train on a single time window and you test on other time windows, that decoder only lasts for about a couple of seconds. And that's the time course of the stimulus and its transition into a choice. So, in, so, so this argues for a highly dynamic population of neurons in the posterior parietal cortex that is plastic, that is continuously evaluating its inputs and updating its encode of the task. In contrast, the visual cortex neurons are highly stable in their encoding and the decoder built at one time can, can stably read out, can be stably read out as what it saw, as what the animal saw and it makes sense. These animals are encoding vertical, vertical or horizontal orientations.
how does this plasticity get instantiated? How does plasticity shape synapses and circuits? And the basic idea goes back 70 years ago to Don Hebb, a, 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 a psychologist at McGill who said when, when one cell takes repeated part in firing another cell, increase the, the strength of connections between them. The vast majority, and th this has been studied a great deal in our field, glutamatergic synapses, which are the vast majority of synapses in the brain. Almost every neuron has glutamatergic synapses. When glutamate is released due to activity in cell A, then a receptor called NMDA receptor acts as a linking cue. If there is some other way by which this cell has been excited, either spontaneously, it's firing spontaneously, or there's some other input, then this magnesium block pops out, calcium enters, and that's a cue for additional receptors called amper receptors to be inserted with strength the strength of the synapse. This has been known for a long time, but we have recently come to appreciate challenges or, or, or issues with a very simple Hebb idea. And one of these is shown here. There is a deep paradox to Hebbian plasticity. Unregulated Hebbian plasticity leads to saturated excitatory synapses and unstable assemblies. For example, if you strengthen one synapse due to a Hebbian mechanism, then this neuron is likely to be firing more, not only when it spontaneously fires, but when this neuron makes it fire, that itself will make other neurons more likely to be, to be coordinated in their firing, such that now randomly, there will be many more instances whereby this neuron would be taking part in the activity of the target neuron and so on, leading to an assembly of neurons that are all in this neuron, and that's not a useful engram. So synaptic renormalization is necessary to stably encode information in neurons and networks. And one form of renormalization as put forward by Gino Torrigiano and others is synaptic scaling, where you take all of the synapses on a neuron and you remove these re receptors on them in a proportionate way. Synaptic scaling occurs over long time scales is neuron wide. All the synapses go down in the same way and it preserves the weight ratio. So if it's six to three receptors here, you go to two to one and that's thought to be one reason, uh, one thing that happens during certain forms of sleep, for instance. But there are other forms of normalization that involve rapid, locally coordinated synapse specific weight changes on dendrites, which reinforce Hebbian changes and, and therefore is unlike synaptic scaling. And one of these is shown here. For instance, if you strengthen one synapse, then synaptic scaling would just bring this synapse down, maybe not all the way, but you would lose at least part of the engram. The idea of locally coordinated plasticity is that you increase the strength of one synapse, but in order to preserve the total strength within a unit of dendrite, you reduce the strength of adjacent synapses. Hence, the total drive into this dendritic uh, uh, segment is the same as before, except that you have strengthened one input and hopefully reduced complementary inputs in order to provide a locally coordinated uh, 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 plasticity that is reinforcing. This idea has been put forward by others and we are going to examine it in a deep way. So what I've told you so far is that cortical circuits are shaped by plasticity, induced during development by patterned electrical activity and in adulthood by learning. And such plasticity may be implemented, synaptic plasticity may be implemented by Hebbian rules and renormalization. Now I'm going to take you into the details of how do we analyze Hebbian plasticity and importantly renormalization in the context of locally coordinated synaptic plasticity. So the idea that you can implement a Hebbian mechanism has been explored in many different experimental paradigms that all have biological plausibility. And one of them is called spike timing dependent plasticity. And here's the basic idea that comes from studying neurons in a dish by Mooming Poo's lab by Henry Markram. If you take two neurons that are sitting in a dish and you stick an electrode into each of them, then you make one neuron fire 
it leads to a EPSP in the other neuron and at the peak of this EPSP or somewhere, you make this other neuron fire. Therefore, this is a pre before post learning rule being applied to this synapse. And if you do this several tens of times and then you ask what happened to the strength of the synapse, you find that it has gone up. If you do it the other way around, if you stimulate this neuron followed by this neuron, and then you, are, you do this a few times and you ask, did that alter the strength of the synapse? The answer is yes, but in the opposite way. So pre, before, post, increase the synaptic strength. Pre, after, post, decrease the synaptic strength. And that's called spike timing dependent plasticity. And it is a beautiful instantiation of HEB and anti-HEB rules. And so when Samuel Bustani and Jacques Ip were in the lab, Sami now has a, uh, is now on the faculty at University of Geneva. Jacques is on the faculty at Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, when these two, again, outstanding postdoctoral fellows discussed what, how shall we use this to probe at a very sharp identified synapse level mechanisms of plasticity, we decided to ask, is STDP, spike time driven plasticity, observed in the visual cortex neurons in vivo? And can we use this to examine locally coordinated plasticity in a single identified synapse at individual identified synapses on that neuron? So here's the basic experiment. And I hope you'll stay with me through this. If you have a neuron in visual cortex that has a certain receptor field, the receptor field is a window on the world that this neuron has is when light falls on this receptor field is when this neuron fires action potential. This neuron gets four synapses from four presynaptic neurons. These four presynaptic neurons and hence these synapses have the following receptor field. Here is the first one. Here's the second one shown in yellow and blue. Here's the third one and the fourth one. Now to induce spike timing dependent plasticity, suppose we choose a location marked by the X, which overlies this neuron's receptor field and a little bit of this receptor field, but not the other two. So we put a visual stimulus on the X, which elicits a postsynaptic response. And at the peak of that response, within, a, within 100 milliseconds or so, we make this neuron fire. And we can do so by a technique called optostimulation. We can, we can express a, 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 a opsin in this cell. And by shining blue light, we can make this cell fire on demand. A single spike within the temporal window of STDP elicited by the visual stimulus that activates these synapses, but not these ones. And we predict that if we do this a few hundred, maybe a hundred times, not zillions of times, but within the, within the time scale of physiological feasibility, then we, then we predict that we would strengthen these two synapses, even make them get larger, because these are the two synapses that are being driven by the conjunction of visual stimulation and the optogenetic spike. Whereas these other two synapses, which are off the, off the visual location, should not be strengthened and should be weakened if locally coordinated plasticity is going to strengthen these synapses and thereby shift the receptor field of this neuron. So post pairing, this neuron's receptor field should shift to where the X is because the inputs from that receptor field location have been strengthened by STDP. So then we went on to examine this. So here's the idea. You take a single neuron in the visual cortex, you fill a patch pipette with GCAMP, which will allow us to do two photon imaging of the neuron's responses and of the responses of the thousands of synapses that this neuron has, at least the postsynaptic element that this neuron has, the presynaptic element is from another neuron. And with mRuby so that we can use the size of the spine as a metric for whether it got strengthened or weakened and channel redoption because we want to excite the cell on demand. And, we, and 
the idea is to map the receptor field of this neuron. And we do that by a procedure called reverse correlation. And this reverse correlation procedure leads to this is the receptor field of this neuron. Then we pick a location, the X, and we put a spot on that location randomly. And every time we put a spot on that location, we make that cell fire. And we do this a hundred times, and then we ask what happened. And we find that the neuron's receptive field has shifted here. And the hypothesis is that it has shifted because those spines that received those synapses that were driven by this STDP mechanism have gotten stronger. We can measure the synapses, their receptive field, their size by two photon imaging of hundreds, even thousands of synapses, but I'll just show you hundreds. And we do this for layer two, three neurons with two photon microscopy. And we can do this for layer three, for, for layer four, five, six neurons to three photon microscopy developed by Murat Yildirim in conjunction with Hiroki Sugihara and my colleague Peter So in biological engineering and mechanical engineering. But two photon imaging allows us to probe the, the top couple of hundred microns and three photon microscopy is, is enabled by long wavelength lasers and appropriate optics. That's a separate story. And here's the result from the spike timing dependent plasticity experiment. We find that some spines are potentiated. Here is the pre-image of a, of a small piece of dendrite. Here is the post plasticity induction. And here's a spine that has grown larger, shown in red. Shown in green is a spine that has grown smaller. And we find that spines that get larger or show structural long-term potentiation lie in close proximity to spines that show structural long-term depression and have gotten smaller. So red and green spines lie in relatively close proximity. And what are their receptive fields like? So all the spines that have gotten larger are on the X which is our visual stimulus spot. The spines that have gotten smaller surround it. And it shows you at a glance how plasticity has enabled a crucial computation about space, that the spines that have gotten enlarged are in a center surround configuration with spines that have gotten weaker and that have gotten smaller. And a center surround filtering of inputs is a is a long-standing, long-known way to enhance contrast in the input. Retinal ganglion cells have it, cortical cells have it, and plasticity induces this deep and fundamental computation. Where do these neurons lie? Surrounding every neuron that has gotten larger within 50 microns, surrounding every spine that has gotten larger is a spine that has gotten smaller within 50 microns. And that leads us to an interesting point. So we submitted this paper with these, with these, with these uh, functional and structural data, as well as other data that I'm going to tell you in a minute. And this paper got two reviews. And one review was a two-page review. It's the show us this and show us that and show us the other thing. No problem. Another review was a two-line review that says, show us that the spine changes are real. And that's a very deep question because of what is known as the Abbey limit. So when we are doing optical measurements, then Ernst Abbey was a physicist, a German physicist, who 150 years ago explained that the finest thing one can resolve with light of wavelength lambda is determined by the microscope's numerical aperture and the numerical aperture of the objective, and it's given by lambda divided by 2NA. In fact, you go to Jena in Germany and there is a statue of Abbey within which this equation is written. And this means that if you use light of visible wavelengths, such as 500 nanometer wavelength or half a micron, and you use that to measure synapses or spines that are on the order of a micron, I remind you that each neuron has thousands of synapses, thousands of spines, each of these spines is 100 the width of a human hair. It's about half, one micron. So when we are measuring changes and we are calling them spines getting larger or smaller, we are measuring them on the order of one half to one quarter micron in diameter. And so this reviewer 
wanted us to prove that this is not an optical aberration. And so to do this, we did a, it took us nine months and the experiment is as follows. We measure these spines in the live mouse brain and then we take them to the electron microscope carried out by Graham Knott, our collaborator at, at EPFL. And Graham slices these identified neurons by extracting them, one neuron, one dendrite of 100 microns within the mouse brain. And it's as if you are slicing a hair along its length into 100 sections. And he reconstructed them. And then we were able to show that every single synapse, every single spine identified in, when the mouse was alive, and behaving, these are all experiments in awake mice, we can, can be reconstructed under the electron microscope. Every one of them shown here from, from spine number six, for instance, all the way to spine number 13 to spine number 33. And the finding is as follows, that when we look at the EM spine volume, that volume correlates strongly with the post plasticity spine size but much less with the pre-plasticity spine size. And that's the way it should be because the plasticity has induced changes in spines. Some have gotten larger, some have gotten smaller, hence the range of the variance, the, the variability of a given spine is going to be much higher when measured against the pre-image but should be much closer to the post image because this is after this is when the mouse had to be killed and the brain extracted and the EM done. That's the point of this experiment. Why do these changes happen? How come a spine changes and another spine changes in, in apposition? And there's a molecule called ARC that uh, has been known for a long time as an activity regulated molecule. ART is upregulated when activity is induced either by high frequency stimulation in the hippocampus or electroconvulsive shock has been known for, for uh, 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 more than 20 years, 25 years. And there's an amazing property of ARC that, was, that, that, that came to be known in a, in a series of papers uh, about 15 years ago, which is that what does ARC do? And ARC role is to reduce synaptic activity. ARC removes amper receptors from synapses. So it's an astonishing thing that one of our major markers of activity is a molecule whose role is to reduce activity at synapses. So, so normalization of activity is so important for the brain that the activity dependent markers themselves reflect not activity but how to reduce it and so here's our hypothesis that when we make a spine get potentiated by pairing a visual stimulus with the postsynaptic spike then arc leaves that spine allowing amper receptors to be inserted and potentiation to happen. And it goes into adjacent spines that are not visually stimulated. Hence, these spines form the surround of a center surround network. And the spines that are not being stimulated are marked by having inactive CAMK2 beta to which ARC binds. And when ARC binds to that, then it removes amper receptors. So ARC is an inverse synaptic tag that is targeted to inactive spines by binding to inactive CAMK2 data. And if this is true, it makes two strong predictions. It says that ARC should be negatively correlated with larger spines. The larger the spine, there should be less ARC. The smaller the spine, there should be more ARC. Second, that if you remove ARC by knocking it down, then the functional and structural plasticity should not happen. So that, the, so, that these, so that these spines should not be strengthened and the neuron should not change its receptor field. We used a probe for ARC and we asked, that, are these hypotheses true? Are they the first one true? So, so we are now measuring ARC and we are measuring AMPA receptors in identif identified spines in awake mice under a two-photon microscope before and after plasticity. 
and we find exactly as predicted that potentiated spines, larger spines, have less arc and they have more amper receptors. And smaller spines have more arc and less amper receptors. When you knock down arc, we find that the distribution of spines as smaller spines surrounding a, fat, a large spike goes away so that the organization goes away and so does the receptor field organization that underlies the neuronal plasticity. And finally, we have gone on in this set of experiments to now go beyond electron microscopy as a measure of super resolution in spines and collaborated with our colleague Kwang Hung Chang to do brain imaging measurements and then do expansion of the neurons and then, and then immunocytochemistry to ask, do identified spines, identified under the two photon microscope, what kind of synapses and synaptic proteins do they have? So here are a bunch of spines. This spine, for instance, has a synapse over here because the presynaptic marker bassoon is over here and the postsynaptic marker arc is on that side. Amazingly, you see something surprising that this synapse, this, this spine, for example, shown here, actually has two synapses on it where the presynaptic marker defines one input and another and apples to those are the arc uh, molecules which in turn are anchoring postsynaptic glutamate receptors. So this part says spike timing dependent plasticity induces a key form of renormalization, locally coordinated potentiation depression in visual cortex dendrites. And locally coordinated plasticity involves arc translocation to depressed spines and arc mediated amper receptor regulation. And now very quickly, because I'm short of time, in the next five minutes, I'll tell you about the last bit, which has much fewer slides as well anyway. How does this map onto actual functional circuits in the brain? And a model system for studying plasticity is called ocular dominance plasticity induced by monocular deprivation. So input from the two eyes align within the primary visual cortex in order to enable binocular vision. And Hubel and Wiesel showed in cats and monkeys that if you close one eye for a critical period, then the Act, then neurons are not driven by that eye as much as they used to, and they're driven much more by the eye that was open. And many others have, such, have subsequently shown, including my colleague Mark Baer, that this, can, that this has happened also in mice. And in mice, if you close an eye for four days, for a few days, and you record neurons, then the contralateral eye when it was open, when there's no monocular deprivation, there's a certain level of response from the contralateral and the ipsilateral eye. If you close this eye for a few days, then this eye drives neurons less. And amazingly, if you continue to keep it closed, then the other eye drives the neuron more. Nothing has been done to this eye. It was open, it remained open for seven days, but the strength of its drive onto a neuron went up. And so this we call a feed forward, reduction of drive and a feedback enhancement of drive. And this feedback plasticity is synapse specific because there are unique synapses that are driven by the contra and the IPCI. It is cooperative with feed forward plasticity because the two together alter the strength of responses from being contra i dominated to now contra i reduction and ipsi i enhan enhancement hence ipsi i dominated and we hypothesize that this is locally coordinated in individual neurons so the model for ocular dominance plasticity at least imposing our hypothesis of arc on this is that there, that synapses and neurons are held by inhibition. You reduce inhibition as shown by Takao Hench and others. That is the trigger for induction of plasticity. And then plasticity is implemented by deprived eye synapses, removing amper receptors due to accumulation of arc, which we have shown, and the removal of arc from adjacent open eye synapses causes amper receptors to be inserted on a slower time scale and hence the enhancement of the open eye. 
Does this hold? Yes, it does with Mark. We did the following ex experiment we using mice in which arc was knocked out. You can show that in wild type or normal mice, re deprivation reduces the responses from the closed eye. In knockout mice, it doesn't. Longer period of deprivation increases responses from the open eye. In knockout mice, it doesn't. So arc is crucial for bridging feet forward and feed back plasticity. And Kyle Jenks in collaboration, working in Jason Shepard's lab in collaboration with Mark Baer showed that ARC can actually restore plasticity in adult mice, even though it has gone down in adult herd. So very briefly then, ARC has a crucial position at the synapse. It is a target of many genes of autism spectrum disorder. Autism spectrum disorder itself is a complex behavioral disorder. It is driven by many, 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 many genes. It happens in children, hence it makes sense that there is a genetic set of risk factors. There are genes that are very rare, but that have massive effect. There are lots of genes that are very common, but each has a little bit of effect. And when we put it all together, we get to ask, even though there might be a few hundred genes, is there anything common about them? And there is. The majority of them are expressed at synapses. A great majority of them are regulated by activity. And we hypothesize that they have a role in renormalization. It's not that animals with knockout of these genes don't have plasticity. It's that they, it's that they do not have the normal kind of plasticity. And this is an idea that has roots in several uh, 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 people's work, Dick Chen's, Sasha Nelson's, our own work, that says that feedback plasticity is a way by which neurons regulate their input. It's as if, if you want to regulate the temperature in a room, you turn on the furnace and it brings the temperature to where you want it. A more sophisticated form we hypothesize from locally coordinated plasticity that you wish to increase the temperature in a room, you bring in heat from the adjacent rooms and thereby you conserve your furnace but use the heat that you already have. And these ideas we think map onto the function of autism genes. And now in this last uh, uh, slide, wrapping up a great many experiments from our lab, from other labs shows that many genes of autism spectrum disorder actually in the ocular dominance plasticity model influence the open eye potentiation or the feedback plasticity. The feedback mechanisms are a crucial target of these genes. So altered feedback plasticity affects local synaptic renormalization and hence stable integration of heavy and plasticity in neurons and circuits. And why is this interesting? I told you about task switching early in the talk. And task switching profoundly relies, as I, as I hypothesized in my model of how posterior parietal cortex neurons might switch from being responsive to horizontal orientations to now being responsive to vertical orientation. These inputs are intermingled on these neurons, but when you reinforce one set of synapses, the other set of synapses must go down in order to implement this plasticity. And that is a classic form of locally coordinated or feedback plasticity. And if a gene that mediates that plasticity is muted, then a animal, a person, would have difficulty task switching. And task switching is a classic phenotype of autism spectrum disorder, difficulty in task switching. So in conclusion, Feedback plasticity in visual cortex neurons is an expression of locally coordinated plasticity and renormalization, and it also involves arc. Feedback plasticity engages many autism genes and molecules. By no means is it the only mechanism. There are many other mechanisms, but as a conceptual framework, we might postulate that dysfunction of feedback plasticity or of renormalization prevents consolidation of plasticity and may be a core component of neurodevelopmental disorders. I want to acknowledge many, 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 many people. 
many people, this is my lab. I'm sorry, I haven't gotten a chance to tell you about them. This is all work in progress, but please visit our website. But I have gotten a chance and I hope I have gotten everybody down, a lot of people who have been in my lab over the last, I've described work, except for the rewarding work from many years ago, only work in the last eight or 10 years. And those are the names I've put down here. I apologize if I have missed anybody. And we have, we have collaborations from across the world. Thank you.